Hello! One topic I haven't talked about in a while is the main topic I started this channel for, evolution and creationism. A very, very juicy topic that doesn't seem to want to die. We've argued about this for like, what, two decades now? And every so often you still see so many debates or videos being created on this topic. Well, this week I got a little bored and there wasn't too much online that caught my interest. So I'm just making this video for nostalgic purposes, I suppose. Here's a video of someone giving us a few reasons to doubt evolution. Let's have a look, shall we? Here are six supposed evidences for evolution that simply are not good reasons to believe in evolution. Number one, vestigial organs. The argument goes that if humans evolved, then they would have had at one time organs that an animal would have used in a certain way, but would no longer be used in that way in the human body, and those organs would begin to atrophy and start to be useless. Humans have a few vestigial organs that are in direct corroboration to what evolution states. For example, your brain. <laughs> But we don't see this in just humans. We see vestigial organs all over the animal kingdom. Flightless birds no longer require their wings, but those wings did serve a purpose in the past. Whales have pelvis bones that had a function back when their ancestors lived on land. Nature is littered with examples like these. And the fact that humans have vestigial organs too really makes you think about how similar humans actually are to other animals. We all got here through the same process. Our phenotypes are all determined by the forces of evolution. Fascinating, isn't it? The problem with this vestigial organ idea is that there are two reasons it cannot prove evolution. Number one, if you did have vestigial organs in your body, that wouldn't prove evolution. You see, evolution has to go from a single cell organism to a human, and you don't need organs that are decaying and atrophying. You need evolution to produce new organs. Evolution works in both directions. Becoming more complex and developing new functions isn't the only path that can be taken. Regression is easy for natural selection to do and is very effective. For example, if there were an organism that was producing a particular enzyme for a specific purpose, but after thousands or millions of years that enzyme is no longer needed, then the organism will begin to lose the ability to produce it. Why? Because it costs resources. Members that did not consume amino acids to produce that enzyme had a better chance of survival. Same thing goes for vestigial organs, although entire structures would take longer than an enzyme to eliminate. These organs can either be in the way of the movement of the organism, get easily infected, or take up too many resources. So eventually natural selection weeds them out. Now again, evolution can head in both directions. Gaining and losing structure and function both play roles in a species' ability to survive. Perhaps most of the time, complexity is the ultimate path that is taken, but that doesn't mean reduction wasn't part of the process. And vestigial organs is a perfect example of this. We should find wings that are almost ready to allow organisms to fly that can't yet fly. We should find new visionary optical connections in living organisms that don't have them. Well, sorry to break it to you, but evolution doesn't work that way. It's not an incremental step-by-step -step formation of an advanced structure. You can't imagine it like a house where each step is just adding the next brick. That's simply just not reality. Wings, for example, don't just develop into half a wing at one point, where it's useless until it fully evolves. The intermediate structures always had some purpose. Perhaps early wing structures were mostly feathers that allowed the organism to glide through the air. Early eyes would have had a purpose in detecting light without giving actual vision. Think of it as a gradient, not a step-by-step -step process. If you're wondering why we don't see any intermediate structures for future evolution, well, actually we do. Everything right now is an intermediate. Eventually, the structures and organs of animals today will develop into something else, perhaps something better. Maybe human eyes will change into something as powerful as a hawk's eye in the future. Our eyes right now would then be considered an intermediate. But anyway, this is a little off topic, so let's just continue on with the video. And the second problem with the vestigial organ argument is that that 185 list of vestigial organs, it began to dwindle very rapidly when? When we started looking more closely into them and it became 180 and then 175 and then... Do you know as we look more into the body, we realize that those vestigial organs were very useful? Some of the vestigial organs did appear to have function, I agree. The appendix, for example, plays a role regarding the immune system inside the digestive tract. It's not required for humans to live and most certainly doesn't play too important of a role, but can we still consider it a vestigial organ? That's up for debate right now, but there are other vestigial organs that most certainly do not have a useful function anymore. Wisdom teeth, tailbone, and ear muscles are very common examples of human vestigiality, where their functions are almost entirely zero and may even have negative effects. If you can come up with useful functions to each of these, then I'd be happy to hear them. Remember that the term vestigial structures doesn't mean they have zero function. An organ can have little function that doesn't play a significant role and it'd still be vestigial by definition. Number two, 
the idea of homology. We're told that similarity proves ancient ancestry. And what I simply mean by that is we're told that because humans have similar physical characteristics to certain animals, that proves that they evolved from animals. Well, similarity doesn't prove evolution at all. In fact, you could see things that are similar and you would realize that those similarities are often caused by a common designer. Scientists don't just look at structures that appear to be the same and that's it. This is an entire field of evolutionary study. Not only can you notice the similarities between certain animal species, you can also map out the order of speciation. And there are plenty of examples out there in nature. The forelimbs of vertebrates is the most common example. There's the bones within mammal ear canals, flower structures of many plants, the list goes on. But how do we interpret this evidence? How do we know it's not just some creator in the sky who just made species look similar? How does this prove evolution? Well, as I said earlier, you can map out when species differentiated and when certain traits arose. Structures are similar but different enough to give us reasonable evolutionary estimates, and by analyzing these similarities and differences, a tree can be portrayed. It'd be weird that an all-powerful being that created all organisms on Earth would put all these subtle differences to form a map of some sort. Not saying it would be out of his control, but it just seems like an odd thing to do. Meanwhile, this fits perfectly within our understanding of evolutionary biology and our tree of evolution. It's not definite proof, but it's evidence towards it. Supposed evidence for evolution number three, the fossil record. You know what we're told is that you can look into the fossil record and you can find proof that organisms evolved over millions of years. Supposedly we're told that you can find transformational organisms that prove this animal evolved into some other kind of animal. But if you were to take that seriously and you were to go to the fossil record, what you would find is that those transformational fossils are missing on a grand scale. Hmm, I don't like talking about the fossil record with creationists because they just always present information that is flat out wrong. They always say stuff like, we haven't found the missing link, or the fossil record is lacking, or the fossil record showed organisms died at once from a great flood. And you can see why those are frustrating for me, because those claims are simply not true. I don't know which person or website out there started this, but their idea of what the fossil record is quickly filled up their echo chamber until they actually believe it to be true. Which is why I won't be writing an essay to respond to this segment. Yeah, I know, right? Arrest me now. Number four, the idea of mutations. We're told that mutations prove you could get a certain single-celled organism to mutate over multiplied millions of years and bring about new information on a grand scale that given enough time, you could get a human being. What's the problem with that line of reasoning? The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. Mutations are an example of a loss of genetic information. I've actually addressed this point multiple times in the past, so I'm not going to do it again. Number five. English peppered <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm gonna explain it. It's very easy to fall into this trap to think that mutations can only cause the loss of genetic information. That's simply not the case. DNA isn't just there or not there. Think of it more dynamically. You have billions of nucleotides, then out of these sequences of A's, T's, C's, and G's, you have certain segments that become genes to be read. And out of these genes, many of their expressions are inhibited. And you have a lot of junk out there that aren't meant to be turned into proteins. These can be in control of the expression of genes, but a lot of it doesn't serve a purpose at all. Mutations don't necessarily only affect genes that are transcribed but rather they can also, for example, activate an expression of something, or change the nucleotide composition of a DNA segment to give it additional functions, increase or enable an expression of a gene. There are plenty of ways that mutations could cause an increased and expressed genetic information or function. Gain of function mutations is a known type of mutation opposite of loss of functions, and you don't only have to think of it in terms of DNA. Protein structures can vastly change its particular function from simple changes. Heck, you don't even need to think of it in terms of mutations. There are other ways to get new proteins, such as translocation. The point is, the claim that mutations can give new function of genetic information is simply false. And this is again one of those claims that seem to echo around the creationist community. It's wrong, and you should feel bad for saying it. For the last hundred years or more now, scientists have been studying fruit flies. They are great examples of how you can mutate an organism. We have been zapping these fruit flies with radiation and mutating them in chemical ways for more than a hundred years now. And what do you have after all the radiation and mutation? Do you have a fruit fly that has evolved new genetic information? No, you don't. In fact, all you still have is a fruit fly. It hasn't evolved into anything else. 
That misrepresentation on fruit fly experiments is so gross I had to drink some flat earther tears to calm myself down. It is true that fruit flies are a popular subject of experimentation, especially involving knockout experiments, which helps us better understand how DNA works. However, scientists don't just put these fruit flies in a chamber and continuously zap them with radiation. No, I mean, maybe there was an experiment out there that did that, but it probably wasn't for the purpose of trying to determine if gain-of-function mutations are possible. Fruit flies are usually modified in specific ways. For example, if we wanted to see a purpose of a particular gene, you knock that gene out and observe the resulting behavior. Or you could breed them in certain ways to observe how genes are passed down. This was exactly done by Thomas Morgan to look at eye color of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. So your claim is wrong because scientists heavily control or observe these DNA changes when they are introduced to fruit flies. None of the experiments tried to prove the existence of gain-of-function mutations by sitting fruit flies in a radiation chamber all day. Also not to mention that we don't continue the same line of fruit fly generation every experiment for the past 200 years or so. Obviously every new experiment involved obtaining a new batch of fruit flies that weren't the offspring of another previous experiment. Your claim is just wrong on so many levels. Number 5. English Peppered Moths We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. You see, before the Industrial Revolution, there were two varieties of English peppered moths. One dark colored, one light colored, but the light colored was much higher in ratio than the dark colored. But after the Industrial Revolution, the dark colored became the more prominent color and the light the fewer in the mix. The problem with this example is, number one, many of the pictures were faked because the English peppered moths don't often land on tree trunks, and the entire idea was flawed in that way. You heard it here first, boys and girls. The pictures were faked because those moths don't often land on tree trunks. <laughs> but the second problem was that before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had genetic information for two varieties light colored and dark colored, and after the genetic information was the same. That's still an example of natural selection. Natural selection doesn't give new genes, it just selects the genes out that are better for survival. It's important to know the difference between natural selection and mutations. Both are mechanisms for evolution, but they are different. Information that's presented to us as proof that evolution actually occurred is not proof at all. If we look at it with an open mind and we study it carefully and we critically consider it, we'll realize that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and all of the organisms, and evolution just simply didn't play any part in God's creation. I have yet to see a non-religious person criticize evolution. Why does it seem like every single person who deny evolution do so because they believe that a god created the universe? I mean, I'm sure there are people out there that break this rule, but it's just so uncommon. Just from that fact alone, you can tell that these people aren't actually critically thinking about evolution, but rather they just want to conform to whatever they already believe in. Anyway, that's my time. Major shout out to Fireshard, Shere Khan, and Elia for their loyal support on Patreon. And also to all my other patrons and YouTube members for making it possible for me to do what I do. Be sure to subscribe for more content like this every weekend and I'll see you later.